witnesses with all the children of your only church we glorify and thank you your father and your holy spirit now and forever amen peace be with the church and her children
as a body is one, though it has many part parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we were given to drink of one spirit. Now the body is not a single part, but many. If a foot should say, because I am not the hand, I do not belong to the body, it does not, for this reason, belong any less to the body. Or if an ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it does not, for this reason, belong any less to the body. Praise be to God always. be the son of David. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man drives out demons only by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. But he knew what they were thinking, and he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself shall be laid waste, and no town or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan drives out Satan, he is then divided against himself, and how then shall his kingdom stand? But if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your children drive them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. How can a man enter a strong man's house and steal his property unless he first tie up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. 
Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man shall be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. This is the truth, peace be with you. So what you have contrasted with this individual who is miraculously healed by our Lord is both the crowd and the Pharisees. The crowd is completely astonished, and that's all we're told. It's just the wow factor. They're all amazed, they're all astonished, and then they do ask the question, could this be the Messiah? Now they use the title of one, one of the titles of the Messiah of expectation of the people of Israel, which is son of David. Messiah is to be a descendant, the son of David. That's what they mean by, they say, is this perhaps the Messiah? And the Pharisees become angry, we're told, when they hear this. And then they accuse essentially our Lord of sorcery. He cast out demons using demons. He uses the demonic power to catch out demons. And our Lord does a very normal thing to say, well, is that not a stupid response? <laughs> By saying, if the devil is, if Satan is casting out Satan, then his kingdom is divided against itself like any house. You fight against each other, that family, that house is going to fall apart. And if Satan is fighting against Satan, then his kingdom is going to fall apart. So be of good cheer. The kingdom of evil is going to be overthrown by the kingdom of evil. And so we said, this is an answer to say this is ridiculous. Then our Lord says, but, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then you must know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. This we have talked about oftentimes, we use the word judgment. And judgment in Greek is actually the word krisis. Our word crisis in English, spelled exactly the same with the C-R-I-S-I-S. Crisis, this term coming to us from the Greek originally, means judgment. It means the ability to discern in judgment. So the crisis moment is the moment you have to make decisions. You have to make judgments. 
And so what's happening here is our Lord, or St. Matthew has contrasted the crowd who think, well, gee, maybe this is the Messiah. This is an extraordinary miracle. And the Pharisees who become hardened in a position. <clears throat> so we can ask the question, why do they become hardened? Excuse me. <clears throat> this moment of crisis, of crisis, when the Spirit of God enters into our lives, is a moment in which we have to make judgment. And what we don't like about it, just humanly speaking, is it upsets our routine. It upsets our parameters. It upsets our organization. And God is always doing this to us. And so the Pharisees are educated men. They know the law of Moses. They know the law of God. They have their routine. So when our Lord comes and upsets this, or when the people start saying perhaps this is a Messiah, this upends their part and they become angry. Now we can look at the Pharisees and say, well, that's an interesting historical moment. But really it's applicable to each one of us. We all like our routines. We like our lazy boy. We like the way that the fridge is organized just so, our pantries, our routine, our daily routine. We do this, but grace always comes into our lives and it upsets the thing. Because we're not meant to be living here permanently. We're always trying to make something habitual, something routine, something predictable. Healing of people who are blind and mute is not predictable. That man is always going to be blind and mute. He's always been blind and mute. He's always been blind and mute. It's an upsetting of a routine. We like our routines. When we look at these things, if we cling to these things, they will always make us in opposition to God. Now, not necessarily in a mortally sinful way, but in a way that will bring to us discomfort. I have over this last week been sharing you know, we do this when we get old, right? We tell the same story over and over again. But I don't think I've told you this one. I know I've told you many of them many times, but this one. But I've been thinking about it because of the 35th anniversary of priesthood. And how, when I, and I told the Legion of Mary this story, so I excuse myself to the Legionaries because they're definitely hearing it for a second time. And when I was first ordained many decades ago, I was sent to teach and be headmaster at a school, boarding school, about 400 kids. And it was quite an eye opener. I was only 25. And it was quite an experience, and it was quite beautiful. And everything went very, very, very well. I like teaching. Probably you know that. But the kids also responded well too. Mostly high school, mostly the high school boys. I taught just the senior girls. And of course, I got into my routine, which was an insane routine. It went from five in the morning to 1 a.m. every day. Just because I also had a parish in Kansas City that I was taking care of also, along with this teaching nonstop all week long and confessor to the schools. And it was all rolling along very nicely, month after month, month after month, one year, two years, and then they changed administration. I was assistant headmaster, not headmaster. And there was a decision made in which they basically changed the entire faculty of the high school. Now we can argue whether that was a good decision or not, but I was in the faculty of the high school. And so I received another assignment to leave. And I have to say that in true confession style, at the age of 27, that was profoundly devastating to me. Now, I went on to teach in many other schools on many other continents. But the key was why. It was one of the great lessons in my life. 
I have made that job. The honor of God, salvation of souls. Yes, 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 yes. Check, 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 check. But I had made it my routine. And I had become complacent in that teaching. There was good response from the students. I still have students from those years who still keep contact with me. Almost four decades later. They're grandfathers now. That's really, like, scary. But the problem with it is I could tell myself rationally, well, they cleaned out the whole faculty. A lot of my friends also, well, they had to go find jobs. The benefit of being a priest is you always have a job. It's just somewhere else. <clears throat> and I could tell myself rationally that, but emotionally, emotionally, I was in complete turmoil because I had expected it to be this way forever. I had expected that routine to always be there, and we all do this. But it was one of the greatest lessons that the Sacred Heart ever gave me, one of the most painful and one of the most efficacious. This is what's happening in this Gospel today. If I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then you must know that the Kingdom of God has come upon you. As long as we hold on to things in our lives and want them to be just so, we know this. This is why we nitpick and snip at each other within our families. You left the toilet seat up. You didn't, who ate my yogurt? Who did this? Who did that? Because we want everything to be predictable, but it's not. It's like I gave reference also when we speak about the name of Jerusalem. You watch the news now. Jerusalem means vision of peace. There is no geographical spot on the planet that has been less in peace throughout the history of the world than Jerusalem. Now why did God name it Yerushalayim? Yerushalayim because He wants you to understand that the holy city itself is not a permanent thing. It is a place where God touches, where we are meant to learn, and we are meant to hear and to see and to follow and return praise in Barakot. That is the very lesson given to us to understand that everything is ephemeral. And when we say ephemeral, we say that in English and it means it's passing away. But ephemera actually comes from the Greek meaning a day. It lasts only for a day. We spend so much time doing so many things in our lives which actually have no purpose. And the real purpose of our life, to hear the voice of God, to see God, and to respond in praise of Barakot, the way our prayers always end, and we raise praise and glory to you now and forever, they end that way because it's very Jewish. And we are descendants of those Jewish converts. And the notion of Barakot and responding to God's blessings, and we bless back, is a very profound understanding. But when I'm hanging on to my pantry, and my lazy boy, and my routine, and the color of the living room, and all these things, and these are things that I will fight over. And when they become changed, I become destabilized. We are in actually a very bad way. We are deaf, and we are blind. And we cannot return as the mute people. We cannot return as being mutes. We cannot return the proper praise to God. This is why our Lord says in this context, he who is not with me is against me. Because everything that we do not receive as blessing in its ephemeral reality and do not return praise for, we stand in opposition to the Lord Christ. And in standing opposition, we do ourselves damage because the Lord God, the Sacred Heart, is the instigator par excellence. He is always there disturbing us, moving us forward because He loves us. We all have a favorite bicycle. We all have the favorite little mangy blanket when we were little. If our lives had stayed at that level of that disgusting blanket, could you imagine where you'd be now at 60? It would be absurd. It's not even imaginable. But what we forget is that blank is only the first of the things that we attach ourselves to. We go through life continually like this. This is what we see the opposite contrast in the Gospel of St. Luke, 
with Zachariah and with the Blessed Virgin Mary herself. The Blessed Virgin Mary never in her wildest imagination considered being the mother to children that she would bear. She was among the Anawi. She had chosen her celibacy, which is why she's mystified by the message of the angel. You know in the choir loft, when you all get up and keep moving around, you are the ones I see all the time. It's like in a classroom. Everyone who sits in the back thinks, well, they're sitting in the back, but those are the people I actually always see. People up front, the studious ones, yeah, you don't notice them. So just a word to the wise for the choir. It moves around a lot. Throws me off the Blessed Virgin Mary. So, when we come back, when you consider Zachariah, Zachariah is vision. He sees the angel Gabriel. The Blessed Virgin Mary, we're told that the angel goes to her in Nazareth, but we're not told that she sees him. But she definitely hears him. We have last week and this week a blind man and a deaf man. We have a contrast with Zachariah who sees and the Blessed Virgin Mary who hears. These two individuals have their lives completely upset. One who had become the routine that we're always going to be sterile and we'll never have a child. So now you can tell him when he comes to the top of the stairs. So when this child, they're expecting in their routine that they're just sterile. The Blessed Virgin Mary has chosen to be among the Anawim in the spiritual movement of Israel at the time of our Lord. Both of them have these expectations. But you notice the difference between the two of them is Zechariah doesn't understand. He's not doing anything evil, but he doesn't understand it. And so in the end, he winds up being made mute for, and deaf apparently also during the next 10 months. The Blessed Virgin Mary does not sin against what is being said to her. But she does ask the question, how is this to happen? So in our lives are the things that we become so attached to, no matter how good they are. And that's why I wanted to share with you my adolescent learning experience as a brand new priest, because it was a wonderful thing. I would never want to go through it again. In fact, I would not want to go through most of what I've had to go through in the priesthood again, but I am profoundly grateful to the Sacred Heart for having smacked me around for three and a half decades. Because it detaches us. So that wherever you're at, you begin then to realize it's not about what I try to create, it's what God is asking me to do at this moment. What is the good that I can accomplish in contrast to what is my plan? What's my five-year plan? What is this going to be? So the Blessed Virgin Mary is reacting in that way I don't understand how this is supposed to happen, but there's no opposition. She is completely in sync with God. Zechariah asked almost word for word exactly the same thing. I don't understand this. And yet his is a resistance to his understanding of what has become habitual in his life. That's the meaning of he who is not with me is against me. So really in our daily prayers, what we have to ask is the Lord God manifest the good that I can do today. Show me this. And then smack my hands and remove the snotty blanket from my hands so that I'm not attached to the things that actually shackle me from accomplishing God's will. So much of what we could have done in our lives, we did not do when we are honest with ourselves because we already had our plan. But the thing that God had asked us to do at this point or that point in our lives, we didn't do because essentially we were deaf, blind. And so we didn't actually move in that pathway of goodness because we didn't hear and we didn't see. God will judge how sinful that may have been or not been. But what we do know is that has limited me in accomplishing the great glory of God and the transformation of my soul in virtue and praise and the badakot and to be able to share that peace and that goodness with others. It's a very beautiful vision. So in one way, this gospel that we have read today is very simple, and very straightforward, but the meaning that is behind it is excellent, is really extraordinary. And that's why in the end our Lord says, you blaspheme, you say stupid things, you sin against the Son of Man, that can be forgiven you. But you resist the spirit of holiness, 
You resist the Spirit of God, which is the hand of God's love upon you. But I've always said, cauterizes, burns, it is scathing, it is, it is hard. But in that aspect, if you stand in opposition and you insult God's plan, that's what blasphemy means, is the insult. You insult the Spirit of God, that sin will not be forgiven. That should make us all quick. Because what it's saying is actually extending, he who is not with me is against me. And he who is not with me then scatters, causes destruction around him. That's the real problem with our routines. Those routines don't just cause snipping within the family about toilet seats or pantries or yogurts in the fridge. They actually cause discord so that those who are closest to me in love are also scattered and made in opposition to the spirit of holiness. And this is a very sad state of things. So let us ask St. Zachariah and the Blessed Virgin Mary that they intercede for us and allow us to enter into the darkness of God's plan because God is infinitely greater and will always be dark to us. To be able to see and even when we do not understand to embrace because God has blessed, God has called, and we render praise and glory in Barakot in response to that blessing and that life-giving grace. So may their prayers be a rampart and a guiding light to us always. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
blessed Solanus Casey, be mindful, O God, of the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Be mindful also of all those who share with us today in this offering.
Shall it be to 
Patriarch, Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith, with blameless minds and with purity and holiness, may they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, you are the pleasing oblation. Who offered yourself for us? You are the forgiving sacrifice. Who offered yourself to your Father? You are the high priest. Who offered yourself as the Lamb? Hear your mercy and our prayer rises up in His hands. You offered to your Father for you. Give you glory forever. Compassionate Lord. Yes, 
us, O Lord, lover of all people. Deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways, and do not forsake us. Let us in temptation overcome us, for yours is the kingdom, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shalom Oh, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord God and Father. We ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins, for the glory of your holy name and that of your only Son and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation, and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So we called attention to the choir earlier today. So I call attention to the choir for the admirable work that they are doing under the mentorship of Mrs. Crate, the flautist. I know she will be upset that I called her name out. But she is doing a beautiful job to transfer our melodies. You know in the Syriac tradition, we have thousands of melodies historically, and they're only transferred orally. They were only written down in the second half of the 20th century. So with, you can find some of them on YouTube. Some of them are quite spectacularly done in renditions. But I have to also congratulate the choir because today they also sang for the first time, if my senile memory serves me right, for the first time the Amunda Bashmayo, the Our Father in Syria. We've had it played often beautifully instrumentally, but I think this is the first time, certainly with the whole choir, a number, at least a number of voices to sing the entire thing. I congratulate our young people in doing this to continue a very ancient tradition, a very venerable tradition that we should receive from the hands of our ancestors. The second thing is, always being careful on thank yous. I have changed names, tried to make sure I had the names correct in the bullets and trying to thank for the absolutely exquisite barbecue we had on Friday evening. It was beautiful. God gave us the most beautiful day in the last two months to have it on. And I just wanted to mention, so there are some names in there, but it's all of you, because Ruth caught me after the barbecue. She says, Father, I just want to let you know. She says, I didn't do anything. She says, I didn't send out, so I didn't make a lot of phone calls, I didn't send out all these emails, I didn't do all of these things. All I mentioned to a few people, and everyone just kicked into gear. Everyone started helping, everyone started putting things together, and so, she wanted to make sure that everyone was being thanked for all of the tremendous good work that was done for what in fact was an extraordinarily joyous evening, for which I am humbled because Ruth wanted to do it for my anniversary. But I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. It was beautifully done and Ruth also wanted to let it know that she was not doing everything, that there were a tremendous army of people who put things together. And you know that what's most beautiful about that? <laughs> is it upset your routines, it took your Friday away, it made you do things for the honor of God and most beautifully functioning and operating as a single community and a parish under the auspices of the Sacred Heart, for the glory of God, and for the salvation of souls, and for that, the choir, and all of you, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You continue and you will convert Central Maine. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishments and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.